good sign, actually. So let's um, let's go over it. I hope you had an opportunity. Well, some of us got it in advance. So, um, so all the information that is found on this sheet is in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. All of you should have a copy of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. It's very important that you have that copy and you read it, you study it, you chew on it. What I mean by that is, uh, those of you who have dogs, you give them the bone and they chew it, they go down to the marrow, they, they get every the juice and everything. That's how we should as well when it comes to our faith, to the Word of God, to the Catechism of the Catholic Church. We should all have a Bible, we should all have a catechism. And they're not decorations, don't let them collect dust. They're to take in the hand and read. So let's go over this because we just have a little bit over a half hour to go over it. So it says, Catechism of the Catholic Church, and we're going to go over Articles 1322 to 1355. Those are the articles that you find in the Catechism. So Article 3, the Sacrament of the Eucharist. The Eucharist completes Christian initiation, fulfilling the priestly role confirmed in baptism and confirmation by participation with the whole community in the Lord's own sacrifice, instituted at the Last Supper and entrusted to the church as a memorial of Christ's death and resurrection. It is a sacrament of love and unity, a banquet filling us with grace and giving us a pledge of future glory. So let's break that down. The, the Eucharist, that's referring to the Blessed Sacrament, completes Christian initiation, fulfilling the priestly role conferred in baptism and confirmation. So we have three sacraments of initiation, baptism, confirmation, and Holy Eucharist, the three in one deal. Baptism, confirmation, and Holy Eucharist are the sacraments of institution. Anointing and confession are the sacraments of healing. Ordination and marriage are sacraments of service or sacraments of vocation. Fulfilling the priestly role conferred in baptism and confirmation, because by our baptism we all participate in the priestly role of Christ, meaning offering prayer by participation with the whole community in the Lord's own sacrifice. When we celebrate Mass, we are offering to God the Father the, the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. So it's not like we're, uh, some of our Protestant brethren, they say, they think that we are sacrificing Jesus again and again and again, or it's, one Protestant minister said, oh, the Catholic priest, they ex execute Jesus every time they have their, no, that's not what we, we don't do. We are offering to Christ the same sacrifice that took place on Calvary. So we are representing the same sacrifice. So instituted at the Last Supper, the Eucharist was in instituted at the Last Supper and entrusted to the church as a memorial of Christ's death and resurrection. His death and resurrection. It is a sacrament of love and unity. So that's very important. The Eucharist is God's love for us. He becomes a prisoner in the blessed sacrament, but a sacrament of unity. The word communion, I like to break that down to common union a union of faith. To receive Holy Communion in the Catholic Church, you have to have 
united in faith. You have to have the common faith of the church. You have to believe that it is truly Jesus, that it is not a symbol as our Protestant brethren. The Eastern Orthodox, they do believe it. They do believe in the real presence and they have the real presence. They have valid sacraments like we do. But there is that lack of unity of faith. And so it happens when Protestants, they attend maybe a wedding or a funeral, they want to receive communion, they can't. They have a different idea of what communion is. Or some people, and I get this several times, is if those of you who've been to funeral masses or weddings that I celebrate, I always make a communion announcement. And some people get upset because they think, oh, aren't you welcoming us? Shouldn't you receive everyone to receive communion? Well, that's incorrect. The, the Eucharist is not about welcoming. The Mass, we welcome anyone who wants to attend and worship with us. But when it comes to the Eucharist, you have to believe what the church believes. You have to have be in the state of grace. If you're in mortal sin, you cannot receive Holy Communion. So couples living together who are not married, or uh, if you're committing a, a grave sin, you're missing Mass on Sunday, deliberately missing Mass on Sunday is a grave sin. That's, I'm not making that up, that's from the Catechism. Or any other grave sin, we have to reconcile ourselves in, in confession to be able to receive the Lord in Holy Communion. And that it's a banquet filling us with grace. The Mass is a preview of the heavenly banquet. The Mass is the gate into heaven. So when people say, oh, Mass is boring, I say, well, if you think Mass is boring, you're going to find heaven boring. Because the Mass is a preview of heaven. If we could put on our spiritual glasses, we would see the angels and saints united with us. There's this beautiful image of the priest who's celebrating Mass. And above him is the Holy Trinity, God. There's the angels. There's the saints. There's the people on earth. And then the souls in purgatory underneath. We're all united. We're the church. The church triumphant in heaven. The church militant on earth. And the church purgative or suffering, which are the souls in purgatory. So in Ma at Mass, we are Unite, uh, united with the saints and angels and the souls in purgatory and giving us a pledge of future glory the Lord said if we want to live forever if we want to participate in the resurrection we have to eat his body and drink his blood it's the food that leads us to eternal life so then where it says the Eucharist source and summit of ecclesial life source and summit of the life of the church. All sacraments and ministries are oriented toward the Eucharist, Christ himself. It is God's greatest sanctifying action and the greatest act of worship we can offer. It unites us with the heavenly liturgy and anticipates eternal life. So the Eucharist is the source and summit of the life of the church. That's why we need vocations to the priesthood. Without priests, there's no celebration of the Eucharist. And without the Eucharist, there's no church. The church collapses without the Eucharist. And the devil knows this. Now the devil why always attacking priests, causing the scandals. So we need to pray always for more vocations to the priesthood. So all other sacraments and ministries are oriented. They point to the Eucharist, Christ himself. The host is not a piece of bread that represents Jesus. It is Jesus. When the priest says, this is my body, this is the chalice of my blood, he is holding Jesus. That was my experience the very first time I celebrated Mass. When I said those words of consecration and I lifted up the host, I went like this. Because I, I mean, I've seen it so many times growing up, but to actually then say those words and hold the host, I went like this. It was like, 
It's not like, it's I am. I'm holding God in my hands. I'm holding God in my hands. I forget which saint it was. I think it was St. Alphonsus who said, when a priest said at the consecration, when the priest says the words of consecration, it is a more powerful experience than the moment of creation. Padre Pio said, the world can live the world can live without the sun, but it cannot live without the mass. So that's how vital the mass is for us. It is God's greatest sanctifying action and the greatest act of worship we can offer. Because again, we are worshiping Christ himself. The humility of Christ. It looks like bread, tastes like bread. It looks like wine, tastes like wine. But it's God's humility. Imagine, I mean, if you really think about it, I mean, our mind should explode. This is God. This is God who has all of creation in his hand, becomes vulnerable like a baby. Just like he was vulnerable in the arms of our Blessed Mother and St. Joseph, he becomes vulnerable in the hands of the priest. That's why there's a, some saints, when they had visions of the Eucharist, they saw the baby Jesus. St. Faustina saw the baby Jesus in the chalice after the consecration. And he becomes vulnerable even allowing himself the, the sacrileges that happen. Jesus doesn't escape when those sacrileges, it's not like Jesus leaves the host. No, he allows himself. Again, that's an, a mystery. Why would Jesus allow himself those sacrileges that happen and there's the, the litany of reparation that, that mentions that the greatest act of worship we can offer it unites us with the heavenly liturgy it unites us with heaven and anticipates eternal life what I was just saying we're united with heaven when we celebrate mass but it's also a preview of what we're going to experience what is this sacrament called? Various aspects in each name. So the Greek verbs, eucharisten, to give thanks. The word eucharist means to give thanksgiving, act of thanksgiving. So as Catholics, thanksgiving days every day. Thanksgiving days every day we celebrate the mass. It's not just one day a year. And eulogian to bless, recalling the Jewish meal blessing, proclaiming God's works. So they're different words, Eucharist, Lord's Supper, breaking of bread. So in scripture, in the New Testament, they talk about the breaking of the bread, that's referring to the mass. Eucharistic assembly, memorial of passion and resurrection, holy sacrifice or holy sacrifice of the mass, of praise, spiritual and pure, Divine liturgy, that's more used in the Eastern churches. The sacred mysteries, the most blessed sacrament, holy communion, bread of angels, bread from heaven, medicine of immortality, viaticum, that's the word viaticum is holy communion for those who are dying and preparing for death. Holy mass from the word misa, mission, Ite misa est in Latin. That's where the word mass comes from. Go. The priest says go. Ita misa est. The mass is ended. You go forth. The priest is sending you out. You have listened to the word of God. You have received God. And now you go forth to share what you've experienced. So that's why it's a big no-no to leave early because you're not being sent forth. That's one of my, you know, I think, almost any priest's annoyance when people just receive the Eucharist and go, eat and run. They think it's drive through fast food. In and out. Jesus even complained about that to St. Faustina. He said, they receive me and then they forget about me. They, they treat me like a dead thing. That's what he said to St. Faustina. And some churches... One church, at the exit signs, they put a sign that says, 
for those who leave early mass, it says, Judas left early too. <laughs> yeah, Judas left the first, the very first mass, he leaves early. Why? He had other things to do. And how many people, oh, I, I have to go, I have, I have to, we have brunch, we have to go this, I have to go here. So th that's very sad. The obligation is to come to Mass. The obligation is not to receive Holy Communion. The obligation is to go to Mass. Even if you don't receive Communion, you are obligated to go to Mass. And some people think, well, I can't go to Mass because I can't receive Communion. You still have to go on Sunday. You still have to go. So then, uh, Section 3, the Eucharist and the economy of salvation. The signs of bread and wine. So we see prefigurations or foreshadowing of the Eucharist in the Old Testament. For, for example, Melchizedek's gifts. What were those gifts? The gifts of bread and wine. So that's a preview of what's to come. Or in the book of Exodus, the manna, the bread that came down from heaven. The people were complaining. They would wake up in the morning. They would see what was like looked like a frost on the ground and they picked up that frost and it was like dough and they made it into bread then there's the Passover with unleavened bread and the cup of wine the cup of blessing there is Jesus' signs of multiplication of the loaves the loaves and fish that's a preview because he did that before he starts to teach about the Eucharist. And I, I, I say this if you've been to the Masses whenever we, have, we hear the Gospel about the multiplication of the loaves and fish, I say every time we are at Mass, we are, at, we are present at a greater miracle than the miracle of the loaves and fish. Because in the, in the Gospel it said that it said 5,000 men were present, not counting women and children. So you can imagine if every man had a wife and then they had a child, that's why 15,000 maybe. And yet, at our church here, there's certainly less than 15,000, but we are at a greater miracle. Why? Because all over the world, millions of Catholics receive the one bread, capital B, the Eucharist. They receive Jesus. Millions of Catholics receive the bread again capital b jesus his body blood soul and divinity that's the greater miracle it says uh, multiplication of loaves by taking blessing breaking and giving we hear those words at mass the priest takes the bread breaks it blesses it breaks it then at the wedding feast of Cana, what does Jesus do? He transforms water into wine. Not the wine for not the water for drinking. It was the water to for bathing, to clean the feet and the body. When they arrive, the guests arrive at the house, they use those that water to clean themselves, wash themselves. And Jesus transforms that to the best wine ever made. Because it's presented to the major domo he drinks it like wait a minute this is not this is not, you're not supposed to do this you're supposed to serve the the best wine first and then when the people have have been drinking then you serve a lesser vintage and he says he went to the groom he said you've saved the best for last well, because jesus doesn't do things halfway so it's the best wine but that's now a preview of the eucharist because what happens at mass wine with a little bit of water transforms into his blood Eucharist so Eucharist is uh, John chapter 6 that's where Jesus talks about the Eucharist and the cross are stumbling blocks this is the only teaching where disciples left said many disciples left Jesus because of this teaching Many disciples left because they, they couldn't accept it. It was hard to accept because they thought 
that all oh, they like tear apart Jesus' body, like cannibalism. And that's not what Jesus is talking about. Cannibalism is what? Eating a dead dead man's flesh. We are when we see the Eucharist, we yes, we're eating his flesh. Looks like bread, but we are eating his flesh. However, Jesus is not dead, he's alive. He's the risen Lord. When you receive Jesus, you are receiving the glorified body of Christ. The risen, glorified body of Christ. You are receiving him. And people say, I can't. And it's interesting how our Protestant brothers and sisters, they love scripture. They love the scriptures. Many of them know them better than us. And yet for some reason they're they're blind or they just they've never really focused on John chapter six and you point out to them and someone will say, I've never I was never taught that. By Jesus' actions and words at the Last Supper, bread and wine truly become his body, blood, soul, and divinity, the mystery of eternal life. That's how much Jesus loves us. He's up in, in the glory of heaven, but he's also hidden. He's become the prisoner of the tabernacles. The divine prisoner of the tabernacles. And Jesus says to St. Faustina, you know, come to me and snuggle. In the English translation, he says, snuggle. You, you think snuggle, you think of fabric softener. The little bear. <laughs> But that's what Jesus is saying to us. We come and snuggle with him. We shouldn't be afraid. Jesus hides his glory so that we can be close to him. Pope St. John Paul II said that when we receive the Eucharist, we are like Mary at the Annunciation. We are, in a, in a sense, pregnant with Jesus when we receive Jesus in Holy Communion. He is, he's real. He's alive. We are his temple. If you saw Jesus walking down the street and he's walking to your house and your house is not ready, what you, what do you run and you try to fix it in, in anticipation, right? So how much more when he's coming into your temple, your body and soul? It should also be clean in the state of grace. Now we can receive Jesus if we have venial sin. In the catechism, it says when we receive Jesus, our venial sins are forgiven, our venial sins. But if we receive, deliberately receive Jesus in Holy Communion, we have mortal sin, we commit a sacrilege. And St. Paul warns that. Even back in the time of St. Paul, people were receiving Jesus unworthily. And it says in Scripture, they were getting sick and even dying. They were getting sick and even dying because they were not discerning the body and blood of the Lord. So the institution of the Eucharist, so the four Gospels and the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians talk about the institution. And in fact, it is St. Paul who writes about it first. So 1 Corinthians was written before the Gospels were written. That's what biblical scholars say. The 1 Corinthians was actually Paul wrote that before Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John wrote their Gospels. So it is his, St. Paul is the one who writes about the consecration. So both the Gospels and 1 Corinthians emphasize Jesus' love to the end. Show the night before his death at the Last Supper by washing feet, giving new commandment, instituting the Eucharist and the priesthood to celebrate it until his return. That's what we've been doing. The Jewish Passover is fulfilled by Jesus' Passover through the cross and resurrection, anticipating the final Passover of the church in the glory of the kingdom. So Jesus came to fulfill the law, not to abolish it, to fulfill. So there's the Jewish Passover, but that's in fulfilled in the Eucharist. The blood of the new covenant, the blood that is shed. 
do this in memory of me. Jesus' commandment is not just to remember. It's not we're celebrating something that happened in the past. It's something that happened in the past, but it's an event that affects all of time. So Jesus' command is not just to remember, but to actually do what he did at the Last Supper. The church has always been faithful to this from its very beginning. Above all, on the first day of the week, day of his resurrection. To this day, Sunday Eucharist has the same basic structure and remains the center of the church's life. So this is, how many of you know about Seventh-day Adventists? They're Protestants who worship on Saturday because they say, well, the Bible says Sabbath. You Catholics, you're the ones who changed it. Like, okay, that's actually not entirely correct. From the very beginning, from the time of the apostles, Christians celebrated the mass on Sunday. Why? Because Sunday fulfills Saturday. Because Jesus rose from the dead on Sunday. So that's the fulfillment. So that's why we still observe the commandment to worship the Lord. So Sunday is not the Christian Sabbath. Sabbath is Saturday. But that's been fulfilled now in the resurrection. And so that's why we worship on Sunday. It's Sunday is the first day and the eighth day. It's, it's the new creation. Jesus institutes the new creation, the restoration. And so every time a priest celebrates Mass, we are present at Calvary. We are present at his at the Last Supper. We are present at Calvary. We are present at the resurrection. Kind of like time travel. That moment, Calvary is present. Again, we are not re-sacrificing Jesus. When we celebrate Mass, it is the very same sacrifice that took place on Mount Calvary, on Last Supper, Mount Calvary, the resurrection. But it's an event that covers all of time. So it's not just that we're remembering something of the past. It becomes present. It becomes present. And to this day, the Sunday Eucharist has the same basic structure, and it remains the center of the church's life. And we'll, we'll talk about that just in the next one right here. So the liturgical celebration of the Eucharist, the Mass of all ages. St. Justin Martyr, in his explanation to the pagan emperor in the year 155 AD, he gave a description of how Christians celebrated Mass at that time. And it's in the Catechism, so you can read it there. But this is a very important document. Because what, if you were to read that, if the, I don't know how many of you have already read that, but if you were to read that, you would think, oh wait, that's what we do in, here at Our Lady Guadalupe. So St. Justin's explanation to, pay, to the pagan emperor in the year 155 AD of what Christians do has all the same elements of the Mass today. There's a unity of two parts. There's the word, the readings, the homily, and the intercessions. So that's the first half of the Mass. Then there's the second half, the Eucharist, with the presentation of bread and wine, the consecration, and communion. So we have the Liturgy of the Word and the Liturgy of the Eucharist, the two parts that make up the Mass. So we listen to the Word of God, and we are, we are, we feed on the word of God, because Jesus is the word of God. Now, also, if you read, it says here, like disciples on the road to Emmaus, when their hearts burned, as Jesus exclaimed scriptures to them, and who recognized him in the breaking of the bread. So, I would encourage you to read after after I'm going to explain it to you in detail. But it's a, once I explain it to you, probably when you read it again, it's going to be very different. So how many of you know about the road to Emmaus? The two disciples, 
This was the morning of the resurrection. Two disciples of Jesus are getting out of town. They're scared that Jesus died on the cross. They think everything is lost. They're on their way to Emmaus. They're sad. They're looking down. But Jesus, resurrected, comes. They don't recognize him. And they say, what are you guys talking about? And they're like, what? Are, are you the only person that doesn't know what happened these past days? And I think it was always funny when Jesus says, what things? What happened? <laughs> and they're like, the things that happened to Jesus of Nazareth. We thought he did great miracles and we thought he was going to save us and kick the Romans out and all this stuff. And Jesus kind of scolds them. He says, oh, didn't you know that the Messiah had to suffer and die? And they continue walking, and Jesus explains to them the scriptures. And they, they, they said, after the fact, that their hearts were burning, hearing him explain it to them, how Jesus explains. But they didn't recognize him yet. And then it was getting late, and they were going to stop. And Jesus made it like as he was going to keep going, and they said, no, stay with us the evening. And so Jesus stays with them. They're about, you know, they're going to have a meal together. And what does it say? Jesus took bread, blessed, and broke it. And what does it say? And their eyes were open. That's when they recognized him. This is very important. They didn't recognize him in listening to him explain the scriptures. They recognized him at the moment when he broke the bread. And he disappeared. Why did he disappear at the moment that he broke the bread? Because he was now present in the Eucharist. He was now present in the Eucharist. So they recognized him as we also should recognize him in the, in the Blessed Sacrament. So that's the, and when you read that, it's the whole, it's the Mass. The scriptures, they explain the scriptures, the greeting, the, uh, explain the scriptures, and then the breaking of the bread. The movement of the celebration. All gather with Christ the head, represented by the priest, and all participate. Listening to the word leads all to participate it and intercede for all people. So what does the, the, the word of the Lord Thanks be to God. We give thanks that we have listened to the word. Do we do we give really give thanks or just I mean are we li really listening or is it just going one ear not the other? No, we give thanks to the Lord for listening to his word. Because we are nurtured. We are fed. I like it the word the more the Spanish aliment nos alimentamos. Con la palabra de Dios, we are, we, are, we are nourished by listening to the word of God, which prepares us then to be nourish, nourished by the Eucharist or that connection. How many of us, I mean, we read, we've read the Bible so many times growing up that how many of us then we read it and like something, I, something new comes? And we're like, I never noticed that before. It's the living word of God. Our experiences, our experiences, what we go through, God speaks to us through his word. God speaks to, as someone say, you know, in prayer we talk to God, but in reading scripture, God talks to us. And a priest said, you know, the scripture is God's love letters for us. How many of you couples still have those love letters when you were dating and kept those love letters? <laughs> and maybe you take them out and still read them. Oh, that's, that's the Bible. Scripture is God's love letters to us. Now, some letters are more difficult to read than others, especially Leviticus, but that, there's, a, nothing in, there's nothing by accident in the Scriptures. They're there for a purpose, even those details. 
So listening to the word leads all to practice it and intercede for all people. There's the collection and offertory entrusted to God for his work. So it's not about, oh, the church wants money. I have to, I'm going to sacrifice myself and hand in my $1 bill. <laughs> Poor coin. There's the, um, so the collect, no, the collection, really, what is that? Is you're sharing your own, you're participating in the sacrifice by sacrificing some of your work for the needs of others. That's what the meaning is. That's what the meaning is by giving something that you you worked hard for that for for that salary the, the, that money but now you give a part of that it's a, like a sacrifice for the needs of others it's not about so that that father larry can go to on vacation to tahiti or something <laughs> <laughs> exactly he's like The anaphora or Eucharistic prayer of thanksgiving and consecration is the heart of the Mass, consisting of the preface and sanctus. Sanctus is Latin for holy, 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 to give thanks. The epiclesis is referring to the moment when the priest goes like this. He's calling down the Holy Spirit to transform the bread and wine into the body and blood of the Lord. The words of institution, that's the moment, this is my body, this is the chalice of my blood. The anamnesis, to offer the sacrificed and risen son to the father. There's the intercessions, we pray for the needs of the church. Communion, for those who believe and live in accordance with faith. So for those who believe and live in accordance with faith. You don't give the Eucharist to those who are, don't believe and don't live according to the teachings of the church. So, because when we receive Holy, when we go up, and this is something I tell people too. So five, that was a five minute warning. I need to, I've mentioned it before, but I need to mention it more and more. When people come to receive Holy Communion, it's like, the body of Christ, the cuerpo de Cristo, and they go, Amen. It's, no, that's not, you don't whisper it, you say, Amen. You proclaim it. I believe, what does Amen mean? I believe, I accept. That's a proclamation. It's not to just mouth, or especially when people were wearing masks, it's like, okay, I can't hear you. No, it should be Amen. Not amen. 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 It's I believe. You are to receive. You're go and that amen means I, I believe that's you, Lord, and I believe all that you teach. It doesn't make sense. Oh, Lord, yes, I believe you, but I don't believe this teaching. Oh, I actually support abortion. Can I receive communion? No. No. It doesn't make sense if you're going to, if you, what to, Jesus says so in scripture, that if you love me, you, you'll accept what I command you. Obeying, obeying the commandments frees us. So, you know, that's a battle right now, right now with the politicians who support abortion and they want to receive communion. And we have, you know, Archbishop Corleone of San Francisco who said, I'm sorry, as, as a bishop, I have to, I have to make this declaration regarding a certain person. And other, well, there's others, of course, who say they're Catholic, but, and very, and very scandalously, you know, so, you know, this, this, our, our bishop has talked about these, uh, the three years of Eucharistic revival because it's really, I mean, it's such a scandal when I first heard about that they did the survey of Catholics in the US and they, they said 70% of Catholics don't believe in the Eucharist or don't 
don't believe that is the true presence. And it's most probably because they weren't taught that. And as a priest, and that's something that they're that's one of the benefits. I mean, I'm a product of Catholic education. And uh, I mean, all that I believed, I'm so grateful that my parents put me in Catholic school because I learned my faith. And the seed of my vocation happened in Catholic school. But uh, for, for those who didn't go to Catholic school or didn't go to really parishes that offered a really good catechetical program, they make their first communion and they still don't know why, who it is. And that's a scandal. And so we've, we've got a lot of work, but also this parish is very blessed that we have the Oblates of St. Joseph, we have the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament, we have this beautiful, it's gonna be beautiful when that chapel is finished. We're going to be the envy of the other. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're all united. We're all united, of course. But it's really going to be beautiful once it's done. And hopefully that will lead to... That will lead to... Uh, um, I just lost my train of thought. But that will lead to more conversions, more unity. So, uh, one minute left, so thank you so much. And we're now gonna head back to the pavilion for our conclusion. Thank you so much.